I remember being taken to the career service when I was quite small and they said, what do you want to do in life? And I said, I, I want to be a composer. And I remember them looking through the book and getting to see and like they couldn't find anything under composers. They were like, no, no. <laughs> is there anything else you want to be? But uh, <laughs> see, that actually happened. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who went to see Star Wars in 1977 and was just, um, I guess, bitten by the bug. Uh, I came running home, tried to pick out the tune on the piano and work out the harmony. And I've sort of been trying to work it out ever since. You know, it's interesting that that that's that's a score that inspired you, and, and that Williams was incredibly inspirational to you because that's a big orchestral sound. Um, and I know that you tend to embrace uh, or- orchestral work, um, hmm. and that's I find becoming more and more rare on the film score scene of today. Do do you find that that's the case? It is. I think styles come and go, and I think um, one thing that doesn't ever reach its, you know, past best past date is an orchestra because it's sort of timeless, and I, I think it'll always be there as part of the part of the vocabulary of, of film scoring. So um, I'm I'm optimistic that uh, you know fashions come and go and trends, you know, peak and trough, but. Um, or, Orchestras will be there, but I think how you use them is very, you know, varied, and how you use an orchestra changes a lot. And I find myself writing in different ways for an orchestra today, like I might have been seven or eight years ago, and doubtless in five years from now, hopefully. Um, so yeah, you know, it's the movies are partly to do with changing trends, but. Once you've done a certain number of movies, you you look back and you realise you know you just have to have your own style and although you have to duck and dive with whatever the, the trend is, you sort of have to have your thing and you have to be true to it and otherwise I think you'd just go crazy. So uh, yeah, I I love orchestras, but I you know I love the diversity of the sort of projects I've done. You're you're right, I have done a lot of different things and sometimes that means being really orchestral and sometimes it means being hybrid and. Um, but I guess the orchestra is the backbone of, of, of what I, I love doing. How, uh, and, and then we'll get back to your background, but this, this just brings up this point. How conscious are you of wanting to be a chameleon musically and yet uh, establishing a, a sound that is all your own? Because when I think of someone like John Williams or John Barry or what have you, I mean, they scored any number of uh, genres um, and yet from the opening bars you knew who you were listening to so they were both diverse right. and instantly recognizable yeah I think that's the, that's that's the goal that's the trick for me for sure that that marks out the greats um, and as I said you know you you score what whatever movies come to you and you have to try and do it in your own way for sure because ultimately that's why people want you to work for them because you're bringing something about yourself to it you know they hopefully bring something that I do that people want um, so I agree I think being a chameleon is part of the pleasure of it and you know people often ask me what my fingerprint is what my thing is and I've given up trying to give the answer. I think it's best for someone else to tell me <laughs> because mm-hmm. I just do, I just sort of do what I do and I can't, I, I don't like to listen back to stuff I've done too much. I, I, I like to just keep on moving forward. I get excited by the next thing always. So um, I guess there's an orchestral backbone to it. I love themes. I think still a good theme is something that an audience just, just love and latch on to when they get the right one in the right place and it's a really mm-hmm. hard thing to do and it's so it's uh, a quest of mine to carry on trying to write thematically you know when when it's relevant and there are scores where it doesn't need that but um so i, I think there are also things you can do in film that you can get away with that you can't in other types of music you know you can be a comedian you can do some crazy stuff in the film scoring you know i've had people uh, when I was uh, working on one film we had um, I was working 
helping out on Tim Burton's Sweeney Todd movie, um, adapting mm-hmm. Stephen Sondheim's score, amazing show. And, yeah, you know, Tim Burton said to me, I want a sound, you know, in, in the orchestra that's really, truly horrible. And I thought, well, what's a really horrible sound? And I wrote in the score, fingers down a, fingers down a, a blackboard, <laughs> fingernails down a blackboard. And when we came to record it, the percussion guys did bring in a blackboard and they did this thing. And truly, it was absolutely grim. It sounded horrible, but it really worked <laughs> on the movie. And, you know, <laughs> you couldn't get away. If you did that in a concert hall, you'd have people asking for their money back. But somehow, you know, when you do that sort of thing on a movie, sometimes it can work. So I, I like I like that that, you know, that chameleon crazy, just try something out on a movie and it might just work. I love that about it. Right, right. Yeah, I love that sense of experimentation as well. But there's also something that comes into your work in that um, you, as soon as you listen to a few of your scores, it becomes obvious that that you're a great student of world music, uh, regional music. Uh, and I'm wondering what amount of research goes in to these projects for, for you to find that musical sound for these movies? Right. Well, um, I'd, I'd love to think I'm a great student of it. I'm not sure, you know, if I sat down and took a test, I'm not sure what my scores would be. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, over the years, I've been a bit of an unwilling traveler. I never used to like traveling, but the amazing thing is that life has taken me on some really amazing journeys to amazing places to record stuff. That I would never have done had I not been on a movie and so I've ended up going to Central Africa for Last King of Scotland and recording stuff out in Uganda went to South Africa to do Mandela I've been out in the Gulf um, currently doing some things long distance in West Africa and I, I never went looking for those things, although I, I must admit I'm a, I'm a big world music fan, but I never really think of it as world music and I never thought of it as different music. When I was growing up, I just liked to listen to that stuff. It was all just music to me. It's not, I'm not, I don't have a high church, low church view of any of this stuff. So um, I think maybe that's where it comes from. I just, I just like everything and it so happens that funny isn't it life pushes you sort of in the direction of what you're really open to and I I was really open to that and there have been a whole bunch of scoring projects that have involved doing that I I did a film called Emperor for Peter Weber a wonderful World War II film set in Japan in the last days of the war and um, that was an interesting one trying to integrate elements of Japanese music into orchestral music and the knack mm-hmm. is to try and use those elements, but have them work with the score, not just like flashes of color, sort of generic color, but really try and get them to work with the music and the score so it sits with the with the themes and the harmony in a way that it all seems to be one, not just piled on top, you know, right. you know what I mean. Well, I guess that, that that's the magic trick of a composer is to in every project to write music that complements the material instead of uh con- conflicts or competes with it right and there's there's you know there is a temptation to just slap a big african drum on the top of something and sometimes <laughs> that might work but you know it's sort of it's interesting to think well you know how how could this how could this work if if i was going to use the tuning of the drum and try and you know, fit that in with the harmony or something. I I remember as a case in point when we were doing Last King of Scotland, when we were actually mixing the film, we were mixing it in Germany, and they, the sound. I I went down to Berlin for it, and the sound mixer was listening to the score. He said, "I love the score." He said, "And I, I really want to." There was a scene in an airport at the end. And he said, "There are all these ceiling fans in the airport." He said, "He looked really." pleased with himself, he beamed, he said, I've tuned all of the seating fans to the harmony in this queue. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> um, but I went, to li- I went to listen to it, he actually had done that, and it's a sort of an interesting case in point of like someone, you know, trying to take their thing and make it work with the other elements in the film, and that's, I, I thought that was great, and so I sort of tried to take that approach of like, how can I make the music work with everything in this film, and try and make it you know, feel like it's all part of one big whole organic. Just yeah, of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you, I read something about you uh, earlier last week that you uh, 
did you did you have a mentor when you first started out? Um, was it Simon Boswell? Was he someone that mentored you? That's that's right. I was um, I worked with Simon for quite a few years, sitting you know sitting next to him, watching a composer do his thing, and eventually helping out and doing some arranging and finally doing some writing and then writing quite a lot and. Sometimes there was a movie he couldn't do, and so I ended up doing it. And it's sort of quite a classic apprenticeship, really. And looking back on it now, it was a wonderful. It was a wonderful time. It was very exciting, and there was lots of. The, it was sort of normal at that time to have quite big orchestras in the early mid '90s. Um, budgets were, you know, pretty, pretty good, and so I got used to scoring things with a 70-piece orchestra. So when I then started going my own way and getting my own first jobs it was a bit of a shock to find out you know that not every movie <laughs> had the budget for a 70 piece orchestra but it was a it was a great training ground and just um watching uh watching politics in action on movie mm. on movie sets and in scoring stages as well you know a big part of what composers do is i always think it's sort of somewhere between politics and psychotherapy <laughs> I, mm. I keep meaning to have a nice long com- comfy couch put in in my studio here so the director can come in and just make themselves comfy and just tell me what's you know, what's bothering me. In life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's a very you know it's it's, it's, a, it's a sort of an intimate relationship with the director you know but handing their movie over to someone who's going to put music on it you know music's a very such a personal thing it's it really cuts to the core of people's personal tastes, you know, and people get very easily mm. offended if you don't like the same music as them and vice versa. So uh, it really is like, you know, the, the therapist couch. Let's just let's just sit down here for a moment and talk about, you know, in a quiet, safe space, what what we both feel about <laughs> about this, and making people feel comfortable because really there, there's no right and wrong with music. Um, I want people to come and feel comfortable that they can say exactly what they feel. Sometimes people feel very inhibited. They don't feel comfortable in a musical environment because they don't come from one and so there's that element of lost in translation sometimes. So just making them feel comfortable and getting under their skin is what it's about. Yeah, it really m- music really is about the f- the feel of it. There's something so kind of yeah. ethereal about it, and it's hard to uh, the the effect it has is something that's difficult a lot of times to express in words. So I, I'm wondering what your ideal communication with the director would be. What that ideal relationship would be for you? Well, I I quite like not to really talk musical terminology or even music. To be honest, I, I like to talk or be talked to like an actor, I want the director to say, you know, how how do you want the audience to come away from this scene feeling? You know, if I was an actor, tell me how exciting is this scene, how fast, how slow it is. Not not in musical ways, but in just in terms of just in terms of you know, if an actor was pacing it out. And that that is really helpful for me because it's broad brush character. It's about what's the character of what's the motivation. What's my motivation? <laughs> you know? um, it, it, in a way that that cuts much more deeply into the director's insight for me than them saying, you know, I, I always felt like a piccolo would work here because that may be the case or it may not be the case. It may be that there is some vocabulary issue going on, or sometimes people are very uptight about talking about music. Maybe they remember being at school and they didn't like their music teacher or something. So, you know, I'd much rather be talked to like an actor um, and find out what the motivation in the scene is and then translate it into that mysterious, as you say, that intangible Mm. thing. Because music is it is intangible and it's it's sort of like trying to catch rainbows. You just you can't you can't talk about it. You just have to do it and then go from there. It's very hard to discuss in the abstract. And if it if it's a challenge sometimes to get on the same page with a director, even though it sounds like the majority of your 
uh, collaborations have been very harmonious. Uh, how how much of a challenge is it to get on to get your orchestra on the same page? What what are the preparations that take place for, for that to happen? Well, it depends whether um, I'm married to a violinist. Um, so if my wife is concert master, then I know everything is going to be well under control. Um, and hopefully I might get a family discount if I'm lucky as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, uh, my, my wife, Maya, did uh, lead all the orchestral sessions for 11, 22, 63, and that's it's actually a wonderful opportunity. We don't get to work all that much together, but it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity when we do. Um, uh, so there's that. Um, when I don't have that privilege, I do have uh, an orchestral contractor, uh, here in uh, LA and also in London who I work with very closely and they, they've they known me for many years and I know I know most of the key players in, in, in these two cities in London and LA so I'm very familiar with uh, with all the people and that, that really helps I think it cuts me a lot of slack when I'm in front of an orchestra because mm. I feel like there's a connection there and that's one of the reasons why I always like to conduct orchestras i feel like if i'm in the box there's a barrier there's a glass barrier between me and the people playing the music and it's although i might be physically closer to the director i feel a bit dislocated and not able to communicate what they're saying to me through the glass so i'd rather be in front of the orchestra and i find it much quicker to change things on the fly and rewrite things and just get the shape right in front of the orchestra and, and the director can talk to me through the glass or scream at me through the glass or smile at me through the glass or whatever they feel like doing. Um, it's, uh, it, it seems to work and I, I actually find directors really seem to enjoy that as well because I think they get their feedback injected much more quickly into the situation with me being able to have them in my ear and immediately do it. And I like to bring them out into the room and meet the orchestra as well and get get involved. I, I can see that really gives people a sense of directors. It, it, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's exciting for them. It is a moment when their film is coming to life mm-hmm. in a way. And it's, 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 it's a wonderful, it's always a wonderful experience. However many times I do it, it's always, it's always a wonder, you know, when that music is there and the downbeat happens and the music comes, it's like, wow. <laughs> it's a joy. <laughs> uh, and, and, and by the, an extension of that is the space in which you record. So w- with so much experience, like you say, in Los Angeles and in England, and are, are you familiar with each studio and, and do, does each studio kind of give you a different quality of, of sound? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I think I think they do, and I try to pick the room carefully for the project. Um, it has largely to do with the, the size of the room, I guess. But um, for sure, for sure, I do. Um, these days, it can be quite hard to get time on scoring stages because um, they're very busy, and because some stages have closed, it's put extra pressure on on the other ones. So. Um, sometimes you know you just have to move around a little bit, um, yeah. but they're all you know they're all great stages and they all have different characters. Um, for sure. I, I want to ask you about two uh, two two of the, your most recent scores, and you mentioned it a, a bit earlier, eleven twenty two sixty three. Now this this is an amazingly uh, ambitious project. Uh, because first of all, it, it, the periphery of it is one of the most crucial moments in American history, uh, and then you have a little bit of like a, a time travel element. I mean, there's so many colors in this project, and I'm just curious whatever you can share with me about your approach to that. Well, you're you're right. It is really ambitious, um, and it's a big book that it's adapted from the Stephen King book is I, I think it's eight or nine hundred pages so it's it's a real doorstop so just getting that into a format that works on the screen is a huge is a huge deal and Bridget Carpenter who is the uh, series um, showrunner I guess and who oversaw that whole process 
um, I think did an incredible job in just translating to the screen so well. Um, so I came on board as the first, uh, I guess the first cuts of the first episodes were being put together. So I, I never got to see the whole thing all together until you know we got to the very last day of the very last one. So um, trying to imagine what the shape of it as a whole was part of the challenge because it's as you say it's a big it's a huge story with loads of characters and lots of side shoot stories it goes off in this direction and that direction and that's what i love about it it's 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 really unusual um i think i i started to try and focus early on on what the main themes are both musically but also you know story themes and the idea is that Jake goes back in time to try and stop the assassination of JFK. That's you know, that's the concept. But early on, you realise that it's not going to be so easy because, first of all, every time he tries to change the past, the past tries to stop him either by breaking his car down or dropping a chandelier on his head or having him get run over. Whatever it is, you know, it's like the harder he tries, the harder the past pushes back. And so um, we talked with the director and the producer early on about how the past could sort of have its own theme or motif. And you'll hear that in a lot of the episodes. It comes on the cellos and basses, and it's a sort of very low, just a three or four note pattern. But it it, it was a very useful way of being able to signify that happening. And, and actually, we left quite a few clues in the score because sometimes... It's not clear on screen whether a character is something motivated by the past pushing back against Jake or whether they are a real person doing something. And so we laid a few, if you listen really carefully, you'd be able to, you, you'll hear a few clues of which characters are motivated by the past with that little theme. Mm. Just a fun thing to do. It, it's so interesting to me that working on a, uh, on on kind of the, the, the submit a mini series, but the but the kind of episodic nature of this, uh, like for from an actor's perspective, if you read the first script, uh, that doesn't necessarily tell you where the character is going to go in the last script, and you might not get the last script right. until a couple of weeks before you shoot it. So, are you making the right decisions in this first episode that will? still make sense in the final episode it, it is was it a comparable challenge with this project or did you have the entire screenplay all together and you had a good idea of where it was going well that's a, that's a good question um you know i had an outline of the whole thing i knew i i had a story outline so i understood the arc of the thing but honestly i don't think anyone had an idea because um the, the episodes were turning over really quickly. They were still shooting the latest episodes when we were scoring the earlier ones, so no one had seen the whole thing. So there is an element of having to just, you know, leap of faith, jump off the end of the cliff and hope that uh, there's something soft and squidgy <laughs> waiting for you <laughs> at the bottom. But, <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I think that is, that's movie making, though, because, you know, when you look back, and see a movie that you've done when it's finished, you watch it with an audience, it's sort of obvious. You go, oh, that's what it is. But whilst you're making the thing, it's like you're looking at it through some misted spectacles and you can sort of see it and you sort of have to guess what part of it is. It's it's a funny thing. So that is really, that is the process that, that I'm used to is just having to imagine how it's going to come out. But you're right in, the, in this sense because it's a mini series and it's quite it's quite long. You you don't quite know how the last episodes are going to look until they come in. Um, so mm. I I think we made a good I think we made a good guess. But I think also we we laid out material that um, could develop. And so of course as the as the as the episodes go on, that that material comes back and gets morphed and developed. So by the time you get to episode eight. It's, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but it has the, the show has turned into something that you weren't expecting, and the music has taken that turn with it. And I, I mm. think um, I think you'll feel that the audience will feel that when they watch it on a run. And you're you're also working on Roots. Are are you still working on that, or is that done? Or? 
Uh, we are still working on it, but I have uh, I have a hot computer screen and a piece of paper <laughs> and a pencil next to me at this minute. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. It's very very exciting. It's um, it's an incredible it's an incredible opportunity to tell this story, be involved in telling the story of Black America. Basically, it's a, it's a it's a, also a fascinating insight into this country as well to try and understand it from from the perspective of how slavery came about and how it was abolished. Um, so yeah, we're right in the middle of it at the moment. It's 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 pretty exciting. Watch this space. <laughs> and and how how uh, aware are you of the uh, of the score from the original roots, which I believe was. Uh, Quincy Jones, his work, and, and Gerald Freed, I think. That's right. I think, yeah, I think I think Quincy did the first one or was involved in the first one. Um, I have not gone back and watched them. I wanted to, um, I think I might do that after we've finished. But um, yeah. this is a totally fresh, this is a sort of a fresh postmodern 2016 look at Roots. So um, I thought yeah. it was best not to look at the old one and reference it. Um, so it's it'll be fascinating to watch the old series. I'm sure, you know, the perspectives will be very different. The, I mean, it's what 35 years since the the original one was made. And so in some ways the world is very different. In other ways it's not. But um, yeah, that'll be interesting. It's very I, I think it's a great. It's very, I think it's very, a great time to return to that material yeah. actually. It's a it's um, a great time. I think it's very timely, and I think it's I think it's very strong. Now, are you working with multiple directors on this project? Are there different directors each episode? On on which one? Roots. On, uh, or on each roots? Yeah. section? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. There, there, it's uh, split into four four nights. They're showing it on four four different nights. So there, are, there's one director for each movie. It's it's like four separate movies. They're sort of two, two and a half hours each. So wow. That's a lot of stuff. Hmm. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to see it. Um, yeah. I, I, want to ask, I want to ask you one other thing about the work that you've done because you've composed for some absolutely phenomenal uh, documentaries as well. And I, I'm curious to know if, if there's a different approach to documentary as opposed to narrative. Um. I've always treated them as the same. Um, maybe that's because the sort of documentary making I've done has been more... I've done quite a few feature documentaries that have shown in the cinema with directors like Kevin MacDonald who make movies, who make feature films and documentaries so that maybe they treat it similarly as well. It's sort of... It's storytelling. It's just a slightly different format. So... Um, I've always treated it the same. You know, the one big difference is how much talking is involved. Um, you have mm -hmm. to maybe treat m musically that slightly differently. But no, I, it, it to me it comes down to storytelling, and that's 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 what it's about. Music does that in the same way if it's a documentary or, or a movie for me. Yeah. Uh, my last question for you, and I ask this of all my composers. Um, if you were to teach a class, <laughs> if you were to teach a class on, on, on film composition and you were giving various lessons on different aspects of it, uh, what selections would you choose either from your own work or from any, any other composer throughout history? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, Sorry, that's a big question. Really? <laughs> yes. Narrow remit there. Um, I think the first thing I would teach them is how to look after themselves and get some exercise and get enough sleep um, and the life skills that no one teaches you when you go mm. to learn to write music. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. I never studied doing this. I, when I was younger at college, there weren't really the college courses like there. There's so many courses now, so I'm not sure how it's I'm not sure how it's taught. To be honest, 
I think my mm. best advice would be to go away and have an adventure, a musical adventure or a life adventure, and get an idea of who you are as a person, who you are musically, and that's what makes you into you know a composer that's what that that's what's going to give you character um so there are many great film scores there's lots of great music out there but i think each person has to discover for themselves what they're into what they're interested in and it's that weird mix it might be a mix of world music and jazz or it might be a mix of Mahler and bernard herman or it's you know i think mm. I think just it, those weird mixes and the life experiences that you get from playing in a band or playing an instrument or going off on a trip to South India for six months, or it's all those weird things that add up later on in life to um, what your musical personality is. So go and go and have an adventure and, and find out who you are. That's, yeah. that's probably my best advice, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great advice. Uh, uh, yeah, I love that answer. Alex, my friend, thank you so much for talking to me, and uh, I hope to talk to you again sometime in the future. Thank you for your beautiful work. My pleasure. Thank you very much.